Thanks, Pat. All right, there we go. Uh, well, uh, everything's been going good since uh, we've been away. Just been preaching at different churches, and um, as was mentioned earlier, I've got my doctorate degree as well uh, from Southeastern, and uh, just thank you all for your congratulations uh, for that. And uh, um, also, too, um, I'm actually waiting on a church uh, today to vote on me on whether or not to call me as their next pastor as well. So. Uh, just please be in prayer for me on that as well. And uh, uh, again, it's uh, great to be with you all. And I uh, appreciate the invitation and also for uh, Pastor Lee for uh, allowing me to come and to share the word of the Lord with you as well. Well, today I just want to clear something of you that you have seen the title of the sermon here this morning, which says Burning the Bible. I want to make clear, first and foremost, I'm not advocating you burn the Bible or anything like that, so I just want to make sure, because uh, I'm, I'm sure if, if you all really did think that, that you probably wouldn't let me in here, which I wouldn't blame you on that, but anyway, what I'm going to be talking about here this morning is that no matter what people try to do, whether they try to burn the Bible or try to discredit the Bible or try to say, well, because I don't believe in it, it ain't true, you know, all that stuff, it doesn't discredit what the Bible says. Well, the first English version of the New Testament was actually published in 1526 by a man named William Tyndale. And he, what he did was he actually translated it from the Greek text. If, if, if you're aware, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew and, and parts of it are also written in Aramaic. And the New Testament is mainly written in Greek. And so he actually translated from Greek into English. And he had these, five, these, excuse me, these New Testaments printed in, in uh, Germany. And he had them smuggled into England. Well, he was also involved kind of in a battle with the Catholic Church at that time. And the main battle was, was that William Tyndale believed that the only authority on the truth of God should be the scripture. It should not be just the Pope and the clerics and their teachings. So they had that battle. He printed this New Testament. Well, when they arrived to England, the Bishop of London at that time, Cuthbert Tumstall, actually confiscated these New Testaments and actually presided over burning them. Well, what we're going to look at this morning in Jeremiah chapter 36, this takes place during the fourth and fifth year of King Jehoiakim of Judah. And King Jehoiakim was the son of King Josiah. Josiah was, was a godly king for Judah, and he led, actually led a revival of Judah for a period of 30-some years. And after he was killed in battle, his sons began to take over as king, and all of his sons, unfortunately, were evil kings, and that was including Jehoiakim. And here's how evil Jehoiakim was. There was another prophet named Uriah who was also ministering at that time, during, uh, during Jeremiah's period, and he prophesied the same message of Jeremiah, which is, if they didn't repent, that the Babylonians were going to come and destroy Judah. Well, Jehoiakim didn't like that message, so he sought after his life. Uriah ran all the way to Egypt to try to hide from Jehoiakim. But Jehoiakim sends his father-in-law over to Egypt to get it. And he finds him, brings it back to Judah, and Jehoiakim then executes Uriah. Now, Uriah prophesied by mouth, orally. Just imagine how he's going to react when he gets a mess written message from Jeremiah. And I'll give you a hint. It would involve fire, which is why I had the title, Burning the Bible. But what we're going to learn today is not even the fire will invalidate or wipe away God's Word. So starting at, at verse 1, what I want us to know in these first group of verses that we'll be going through is that, and this is verses 1 through 10, is that the God that we see right, that writes the Bible communicates with humanity. The God of the Bible communicates with humanity. So here's what verse 1 says, starting verse 1. It says, In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words
words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations. From the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah until today. So we see that Jeremiah is being instructed by the Lord. Right now, all the oracles and the teachings I've given you up to this point, from the time that I called you, which was when Josiah was reigning, all the way up until this point. And so if you wanted a specific chapter, most scholars believe it was chapters 1 through 25 of what we have today as the book of Jeremiah. And it was probably a summary of those chapters. Then we get to verse 3 where it says, It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the disaster that I intend to do to them, so that everyone may turn from his evil way, and that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. One of the most common things I hear people say about God in the Old Testament is that the God of the Old Testament is just worried about wiping people off the face of the earth. And you may have heard that, reject, that, uh, that statement as well from certain people. But what we have to understand is, first of all, the people that say that probably don't know the context. They probably may have not even read the Bible. And number two, even if they did, they conveniently left out something in all these instances. And it's this, is that God gives them a chance to repent. And the reason why God gives them a chance to repent is because it is not God's desire for us to be judged. It is not God's desire for us to be wiped off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. He wants us to repent. He wants us to come back to him. And he's doing the same thing here with Judah. He wants us, I mean, he wants them to come back to him. And, he, and God says that if they hear this message, maybe they will come back. So we see now in verse 4. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and this was probably a royal official at that time, and Baruch wrote on the scroll at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord that he had spoken to him. So Jeremiah tells Baruch uh, a statement, and Baruch writes it down. He just continues to dictate to him what to write down on the scroll. Verse 5, And Jeremiah ordered Baruch, saying, I am banned from going to the house of the Lord. So you are to go, and on a day of fasting in the hearing of all the people in the Lord's house, you shall read the words of the Lord from the scroll that you have written at my dictation. So Jeremiah is saying, I can't go to the temple. And probably the most likely reason why Jeremiah can't go to the temple is because back in chapter 27 of Jeremiah, he preached what's called the temple sermon. And that sermon was not well received by the leaders of the temple. And they basically told Jeremiah after that sermon, you are not welcome to come back to this temple anymore. So Jeremiah was not allowed to come back and read his own message. So instead he sends Baruch to go and read the message. And he has to pick what was called a fast day. And the reason why he picked the fast day is because that was when the most people would be there. So he writes the scroll. And now they have to wait till when a fast day comes. And again in verse 6, it says, You shall read them also in the hearing of all the men of Judah who come out of their cities. It may be that their plea for mercy will come before the Lord, and that everyone will turn from his evil way. For great is the anger and wrath that the Lord has pronounced against this people. So again, we see here there's a desire for repentance. Verse 8, And Baruch the son arrived that all that Jeremiah the prophet ordered him about reading from the scroll the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. So now we go a year later in verse 9. In the fifth year of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, all the people in Jerusalem and all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem proclaimed a fast before the Lord. So what was this fast about? Well, they were Proclaimed fast for two reasons. Either number one, it was because there was a drought that was coming. They had planted crops and the rainy season was over with. So they were proclaiming a fast, hoping that God would protect the crops and everything. Or some impending disaster would happen. I believe that reason number two is the reason why they proclaimed this fast. And what was that disaster? It was the Babylonians were coming. And they were going to come and destroy the nation of Judah. <laughs> So we have all these people coming from all the different cities coming into the temple. Then in the hearing of all the people, verse 10, Baruch read the words of Jeremiah from the scroll in the house of the Lord in the chamber of Gamariah, the son of 
upon the secretary, which was in the upper court, at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. So Baruch goes into this room and stands at a balcony that's probably attached to this room, and he begins to read that scroll to all the people that are coming into the temple. Now, that chapter does not record what their response was. Now, most likely, it was probably a mixed bag, just probably like most crowds are today. You probably have some that stood there and listened and believed it and took it seriously. You probably had some others come in and probably listened to a bit of it and, and didn't care after that, just went on. And then you probably had some that probably weren't too happy with that message. But regardless, it did catch one person's attention, which I'll get to in just a moment. But what I want us to see in those first group of verses is that God speaks to his people in a variety of ways, as we see in the Old Testament. He'll use visions and dreams to communicate to his prophets. He'll also use the prophets like Jeremiah, like Isaiah, like Ezekiel, and many others that we can just keep naming to go out and communicate a message of God to his people. He also spoke to Jehovah Kim on, through several avenues. First of all, he spoke to him through his godly father, Josiah. Josiah was a godly king. Number two, he also spoke through, through Jehoiakim through trouble. He reminded Jehoiakim of what was coming if he did not repent. And then three, he also spoke to Jehoiakim through the red word, which was the scroll that we're talking about here. Today, God communicates to us through his word, the Bible. And we can't hear what God says if we have our Bibles closed. Unfortunately, I'm part of what's called the millennial generation. We were the most illiterate generation when it comes to the Bible. That's until, I guess, probably about four or five years ago now when the generation after us, Generation Z, now they're the most illiterate Bible <laughs> generation. The percentage just keeps going down. With the baby boomers, I think they were about 70-some percent, I believe. With Gen Z, it's down now to in the 20s. That's how far it's gotten. With each generation, that percentage just keeps going lower and lower and lower. So in order for us to know what God wants us to do, we have to have his word open. We need to have that time of not only reading the Bible, but also studying the Bible. And even if it's just one verse a day, even if it's just one verse, that's still better than zero. If somebody comes and tells me, well, I just only study one verse, I'm like, that's great. <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you to do it wrong. I mean, that's better than, than zero. You know, hopefully later on you start studying some more verses that you continue to get in that habit, but but hey, if you start off with one verse, that's okay. It's, as long as you're in the word, that's perfectly fine. But that's how we hear from God is from his word. So we see that God speaks to us, mainly through his word today. But God also does this. He also invites a response from us as well. In verses 11 through 26, we see three different responses from three different people. The first one we see is from Micaiah. Verse 11, when Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, heard all the words of the Lord from the scroll, he went down to the king's house, into the secretary's chamber, and all the officials were sitting there, Elishama, the secretary, Deliah, the son of Shemaiah, Elnathan, the son of Akbor, Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, Zedekiah, the son of Hananiah, and all the officials. And Micaiah told them all the words that he had heard when Baruch read the scroll on the hearing of the people. So Micaiah goes and he tells the officials, which today we would refer to them as the cabinet. You know, as we know the president's cabinet, you know, he has different officials for different things. That's, that's how these officials were operating for the king. But Micaiah thought it was important enough for them to know what this message was. So he tells them everything that he knew what to tell them. And then we get to the official's response. Verse 14. Then all the officials sent Jehudi, the son of Nethaniah, son of Shelemiah, son of Cushi, to say to Baruch, 
Take in your hand the scroll that you read in the hearing of the people and come. So Baruch the son of Neriah took the scroll in his hand and came to them. And they said to him, sit down and read it. So the officials want to hear what this scroll says, so Baruch reads it to them. So Baruch reads it to them, and when they hear, heard all the words, they turned one to another in fear. And they said to Baruch, we must report all these words to the king. Now that word fear, the Hebrew word for that actually means this, it means to dread. Now I know all of us have dreaded one thing or another in our life. For those of us that may have had a job that we absolutely hated, we probably dreaded going to work the next day, right? Or for those of us that have had health issues or, or, or had to have a major surgery that we were not looking forward to, we were dreading that day, right? And the recovery afterwards. There's, there's many things that we dread. Well, that's the same feeling that the officials were feeling when they heard this scroll. Because they were dreading the destruction that was coming. And I wouldn't blame them. I'd be dreading it also. And they begin to question Baruch in verse 17. They, they asked Baruch, tell us please, how did you write all these words? Was it at his, being Jeremiah's, dictation? Baruch answered them, he dictated all these words to me while I wrote them with ink on the scroll. Then the official said to Baruch, go and hide, you and Jeremiah, and let no one know where you are. So they wanted to make sure these were words from Jeremiah, which ultimately were words from God, before he told the king. So they get that confirmed, and then they advise Baruch and Jeremiah they need to go hide while they could talk to the king. And I explained to you earlier the reasoning why. It was because their life could be at stake. So, so far, Micaiah and the officials have responded positively. Now we get to the final response, which is the king's response. And this is where it takes a turn. Verse 20, so they went into the court to the king, having put the scroll in the chamber of Elisham the secretary, and they reported all the words to the king. Then the king sent Jehudi to get the scroll, and he took it from the chamber of Elisham, the secretary. So the king is made aware of what's in the scroll. He wants more to be read to him, so they go get the scroll. And Jehudi read it to the king and all the officials who stood beside the king. It was the ninth month, which would be our November or December. And the king was sitting in the winter house, and there was a fire burning in the, in the fire pot before him. As Jehudi read three or four columns, the king would cut them off with a knife and throw them into the fire in the fire pot until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the fire pot. So the scroll was made out of papyrus, and how they would write it, you had one, you know, they write one column, and then another column, and then another column, and then another column. So basically, it would be four columns on a real long sheet of paper. It's probably about 10 inches long, and the scroll would be as long as 30 feet, depending on what they wanted to write. So what was happening is Jehudi was reading the scroll, and every three or four columns that he would read, the king would take it, take a scribe's knife, slice it off, throw it in the fire. Another three or four columns, slice it off, throw it in the fire until all of it was in there. Now, usually, if someone really didn't like the message, they would just take the whole scroll and just throw it in there and not. But you see how deliberate he was in his contempt for God's word. He wanted people to know for sure that he did not believe one single word that was in that scroll. And he thought that throwing it in the fire would take away the power of God's word. Verse 24, yet neither the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words was afraid, nor did they tear their garments. Even when Elithan and Deliah and Gemariah urged the king not to burn the scroll, he would not listen to them. And the king commanded Jeremiel, the king's son, and Sarai, the son of Azrael, and Shelemiah, the son of Abdiel, to seize Baruch, the secretary, and Jeremiah, the prophet. But the Lord hid them. So we see that despite the official protests, Jehoiakim and his servants 
didn't want anything to do with the Word of God at all. And instead, he sends three officials to go out and find Jeremiah and Baruch so he could have them killed. You see, what God does towards us will depend on our response to God's Word. If we decide that we are going to reject God's Word, God will judge us. But if we decide to accept God's Word, God will transform us through His Word. But again, what God does depends on our response. And He allows us to make that choice on what that response will be. He didn't make us to be robots. He made us to where we could have a choice. Some people will choose to, to believe this word. Some others will not. And depending on their response comes the consequences. As the Bible says, we reap what we sow. If we sow it into the world, we're going to reap the world. If we sow it to God's word, we're going to reap God's word. So we see God speaks to humanity, he invites a response, and then finally, even though the Bible can be rejected and it can even be burned, it does not invalidate it. It does not invalidate it. Let's look at these last group of verses here, verse 27 to 32. It says, Now after the king had burned the scroll with the words that Baruch wrote at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Take another scroll and write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned. So he's ordering Jeremiah, I want you to take another scroll and write down what was on the first one, on this new one. And so he does that. Then he addresses Jehoiakim, starting in verse 29. He says, And concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, you shall say, Thus says the Lord, you have heard in the scroll, saying, Why have you written in it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land, and will cut off from it man and beast? Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, He shall have none to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat by day and the frost by night. And I will punish him and his offspring and his servants for their iniquity. I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the people of Judah all the disaster that I have pronounced against them, but they would not hear. So the first thing he says that is going to happen to Jehoiakim is he's going to be punished by death. Now the Bible doesn't record his death, but a Jewish historian named Josephus wrote that during the second siege of Jerusalem, Jehoiakim was killed during that siege. And what they did was the people of Judah actually had his body on the donkey. They took him to the wall, and then they took his body and threw it over the wall. And he was not buried. He, his body was just laying there outside the wall until it decomposed. And none of the people of Judah missed him, which... The way he was thrown over the wall, I guess that probably illustrates that point. But it also says that his offspring would not rule either. Now, his son Jehoiachin did take over, but he only reigned for three months and ten days until he was also deported to Babylon. And then Zedekiah, who was Jehoiachin's brother, took over for 11 years until the rest of Jerusalem was destroyed and they were exiled. And Zedekiah, by the way, was made to see his sons get killed right in front of him because he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. And after they did that, then they took a hot sword and put it against his eyes and blinded him before they took him to Babylon. But everything that God said was going to come true came true. Then the last verse. Then Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote on it at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the scroll that Jehoiakim king of Judah had burned in the fire. And many similar words were added to them. And that's how today we now have the book of Jeremiah. But you see, God's word has been transmitted to us at a great risk to people's lives. When Tim Dale, who I shared with you earlier, ten years after he published 
that first New Testament, he was executed by strangulation. And then his body was burned at the stake. But there was also another man named John Wycliffe who lived before him. He was born in 1328 in England and had his battles with the Catholic Church as well over the same issue. And he also began to be involved in translating the Bible in English as well, but he actually translated from what's called the Vulgate, which is the Latin version of the Bible. So he translated from Latin to Greek. And today, over 150 of his manuscripts still survive. Some of it are whole manuscripts, some of it are partial manuscripts. But on uh, December 28, 1384, he was saying Mass on, on a holiday called Holy Innocence Day. And while he was saying Mass, he suffered a stroke and died shortly thereafter. But 31 years later, after he passed away, the Catholic Church held a council called the Council of Constance. And they declared Wycliffe a heretic. And after they did that, here's what they did. They found where he was buried. They took him out of his burial place. They burned his body to ashes, and then they spread his ashes along the river that flows through Lutterland. It's called the Swift River. Now, even though things tragically ended there, his legacy, legacy still lives on today. You may have heard of this organization. You might not have. It's called Life of Bible Translators. And their website says this. In 1917, a missionary named William Cameron Townsend went to Guatemala to sell Spanish Bibles. But he was shocked when many people couldn't understand the books. They spoke Cachico, a language without a Bible. Cam believed everyone should understand the Bible, so he started a linguistics school called the Summer Institute of Linguistics, or it's known today as SIL. And this school helped train people to do Bible translation. And this work continued to grow, and in 1942 is when he officially founded Wycliffe Bible Translators. And over the following decades, Wycliffe celebrated many milestones, from the first translation completed in 1951 all the way to the 500 translation completed in 2000. And around the same time, Wycliffe adopted a new challenge, a goal of seeing a Bible translation project started in every language, still needing one, by 2025. And as of right now, they have 2,000 languages left that they need to start projects on in order to translate them into that, in order to translate the Bible into that language. But I want to end today with three takeaways I hope you take from the sermon today, because God is always working to preserve his word. First of all, again, God speaks to us through his word. As 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now you may say, well, Jeff, I thought men wrote the Bible. Well, yeah, there were individuals that wrote the Bible. In fact, it was 40 different individuals over a 1,600-year period that wrote the whole Bible. Now, try to make it 40 different individuals to come together and agree on one thing at the same time. Most likely it's not going to happen. But God took 40 different individuals who lived in different time periods to write the Bible and not contradict itself. Now you hear some people say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. Here's how you answer that. Just ask them, okay, name one. Nine times out of ten, they can't think of one. And whenever they do pick one, usually they take something out of context. But that's a whole other sermon for another day. But God speaks to us through his word. Second, God keeps his word. God keeps his word, whether it's in blessing or whether it's in judgment. Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, it says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven 
and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. There's people today who are still being saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter where they may be. People here in the U.S., people all throughout the world. Because God's word, as the King James has it, does not return void. Whenever God sends his word out, it's always for a purpose. And it will always accomplish his purpose. So we know God speaks to us through his word. God keeps his word. Finally, we should obey his word. And we should obey his word. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 is my, one of my favorite verses. And I would say it's my life verse as well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. If we don't have our Bibles open, if we're not in our Bibles, we're basically going through a wilderness when we can't see anything. And Peter says that in that wilderness, there's a lion out there who's seeking someone to devour. And when you're in the wilderness, you can't see anything, that lion can be hiding anywhere. And by the time you realize it, he's already got you. And that's the way Satan works. But when we know his word, and not only have it up here in our head, but have it in our heart as well, he'll make that path through the wilderness for us. It may not be the easiest path, because let's just be honest. And you nowhere in Scripture it says that being a Christian is easy, or living the Christian life is easy. I know there's some pastors out there, I'm not going to mention names, that will say, if you become a Christian, you have all this money, you have all this fame, you have all this stuff. Yeah, right. My response to that is this. Why would you want all that when you have the best person you can ever have? That's Jesus Christ himself. Amen. When you have Jesus Christ himself, you can't go wrong with that. And he will certainly direct your path. So may we always know he speaks to us through his word. He keeps his word. And we should also obey his word because he will always lead us in the right direction. And even if someone tries to discredit or burn the Bible, God will always preserve his word. So I'm going to ask you to join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, I just thank you for the opportunity to preach your word this morning. And Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that we would always know that you preserve your word and that you stand behind your word. And because of that, we can obey your word. But I pray, Lord, that as Christians, that we go back into your word, Lord, and study your word and not only know it in our head, but also have it in our hearts so that we can follow you with the strength of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be able to do that, not in our own strength, but in your strength. And I pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.